is love is love on the queer family podcast love is love you know at, at some point i you know understood that i was going to be having a girl and i just thought about what would it mean for me as a girl dad to really create this environment in which she feels not just loved but also valued and empowered and especially for a, a young girl of color even more so Welcome to the Queer Family Podcast, y'all. The show all about family, but with gay. My name is Jamie, by the way. I'm your host. And you, my friends, are tuning into the show whose mission is and always has been to uplift, highlight, celebrate, and normalize LGBTQIA plus families and all of our beautiful identities. And this episode does not disappoint on that front. We even have my good friend Shafatia, a true ally here. <laughs> I try. I try. Welcome, Shafatia. <laughs> Thank you. you. I'm going to stop you, Jamie. Okay. My name is pronounced Safatia. What? <laughs> well, why is there an SH? It's Safatia. I knew that. I've always like, <laughs> tried to like, like try to be like Safatia, like, because I wasn't sure. Because like there's a, a dance. H. There's four H's. You ignore the H's except for the one that's with the P because that one becomes an F. It's a hot mess. Yeah. Wh- where did that name come from, Safatia? Old Testament, Old Testament Bible. Oh. Oh. Like Jehoshaphat, Methuselah, all those H names. There, I feel like there's a story there. There's also a story. If you're lo- watching the video, we're going to get into this. <laughs> Fatia has a huge American flag behind her. And I think I've never known anybody with, with such a love of flags. We're going to get into that. Two flags. Oh, my gosh. That's two more than I have. <laughs> I want to tell you who's coming in for the interview. Yes, really please. Good so Roberto Concepcion, amazing mm-hmm. name, single gay dad by choice through surrogacy. He wanted his daughter to be able to see her family represented because he couldn't see it. So he created it himself. He wrote a children's book that mm-hmm. celebrates his family and his family makeup. And obviously, you know, I love that shiz. So, yes, 100%. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Be, be the change you want to see and make it. Make the thing. So 100%. It's a really wonderful story and interview, and I love him, and everybody needs to go buy his book after this. It's in the show notes. But, Safatia, you're no. here. True ally. One of the best allies out there. You and my mom. Does she give you obnoxious notes like I do? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. She. what she does is, like I said last week, she like be like, I heard what you were talking about, about, you know, when you had to, when you were trying to come out and then she has to like get deep into it and like, like make me feel extremely uncomfortable. (laughs) Who was the one you said you made out with in high school? I'm like, oh my God, mom. She's like, like, got your, she's got your yearbook out. She's like, uh which was the one? (laughs) Yeah, she did. She was like, who's the, I was listening to that other episode and you were talking about the one friend you told and then they never spoke to you again. She was like, who was that? Which friend? (laughs) Oh my God, mom. I'm like, I'm like, it was this. She's like, who? I don't know that person. I know. So She's going to track him down. She's oh going to track God. him down. It's a whole thing. But that's what I get from my mom. And from you, I get notes, literal <laughs> notes. Like, <laughs> but it's good because you yeah. listen and it makes me, makes me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. I love, 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 love the podcast. As you know, I tell everybody about the podcast. I, did I tell you I brought your podcast up in my most recent job interview? No. Oh, yes. I was interviewing with a woman and she's married to a woman. They have children. And she was like, you know, we use the sperm donor. I said, oh, did you use California cryobank? And she was like, what? Yes. I I said, oh, okay. I said, did you use the same, you know, did you have to like bring the the donor back? Because she talked about how like the first two had the same donor and then there was a gap and then they wanted to have the third. I said, oh, did you, you know, have to bring him out of retirement? And she was like, I don't understand what's happening. I said, oh, well, my girlfriend, you know, she has a queer family podcast. And she said, oh, I've heard of it. I said, oh, you should listen to it. And, you know, it, it, uh, you know, brings LGBTQIA plus families. It's, it's family, but with gay. And, you know, I'm like giving you her your whole like opening spiel. And she's just like, like, uh, if I could afford, but I got the job, so you did. And if I could I afford did. you, I would bring you on board on the team. Anytime, anytime, anything you want me to do, I'm here. Oh my God. I love this. And I love that you really do tune in week after week and you listened to last 
week's episode. Yeah. I wanted to talk about this with you. I wanted to talk about, because they did bring up the fact that one of their children is on the autism spectrum. Uh, it was mm-hmm. Mylan and SK Stokes Kennedy. If you haven't tuned into that episode, everybody go listen to last week's episode because it's really good. It's a really great one. And yeah. my, mother, my mother guest co-hosts and that's a whole. <laughs> I mean, that is a whole other thing in and of itself. It's fabulousness. It's beautiful. And also like you can see me cringe as she says certain things. But anyway, <laughs> but you as well, Safatia, have a child on the autism spectrum. Correct. And yes. That said, you you would want to talk a little bit about that and like what were your thoughts on because it was it was just a quick little segment. I didn't It's a even, quick little snippet. Yeah. yeah. I didn't even know that that they were gonna bring I didn't even know that they had a child on the autism spectrum. So it was mm. so quick. If I had known I probably would have planned to go more in depth. But go um, into that a little bit more. Yeah, because I think it's something that we should talk about more. And I know there's a lot of families who have children on the autism spectrum. Yeah. It's something that I would love to go deeper in with families and parents and things. I have two kids. Uh, Grayson is Rose's friend from school. That's how Jamie and I are in each other's lives. Mm -hmm. And um, then my older child is Jordan. She is 14 now. She has autism. I know it's wild. It's so funny just to think of how long we've been friends, Jamie, and like the, the change from like when I met you, when Orion came into the world, when I was like holding his little baby. Now he's like running, chasing Grayson down the street and like <laughs> hitting him. And Jordan is in high school now. What the what? Oh my Nuts. God. So yes, Jordan was diagnosed with autism a little later. You know, I think that, and this could be a whole other conversation, but you know, girls tend to be diagnosed a little bit later than boys because mm-hmm. some of the behavior patterns of autism are more easily accepted in girls than yeah. they are in boys. So you have like kids that are quieter or, you know, like Jordan was more book, like more into books, looking at books, mm-hmm. whereas the boys, when they have autism and they're not running around, you know, playing with other boys and playing sports and doing all these things, it's sort of like this earlier indication because of societal norms that something is, you know, going on with your child. Jordan's teacher was amazing. Uh, just a fluke happened to be educated in the special needs and pointed out to me that Jordan's speech development was behind her peers. How old was she? She was in uh, pre-K. Oh, wow. Yeah. So older. And up until that point had been mark- hitting all the milestones. No doctor had ever said anything to me. Nobody had ever said anything to us at all. It wasn't until, you know, thankfully we were around this one teacher who said, you know, this is happening and you should be aware of it. And then it was like a whole journey to get to like... And then it's a whole journey. Yeah. Then it's getting support, whether it's in in New York, we call it an IEP, an individualized education plan. So you're due an adequate and appropriate education for your child through the public school system. And that can mean anything from having a paraprofessional who, you know, sort of goes along with your child through the day to make sure they're paying attention, to make sure maybe they don't run away, to physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, to what Jordan has, which is like therapists that are almost all have PhDs or, or MAs and are with her all day long, modifying the class for her so that she can actually learn along with her peers. So mm. it's a whole other thing. And, and, I don't think people who only have mainstream children understand how much of your day and how much of your mind is taken up by your child. So in in the episode, you know, in the background, they hear their kid makes a noise, right? Mm -hmm. And they can tell that's a sign, right? Things are going to go bad. We have to jump right now. There's no, there's no space. There's no, oh, he'll be okay for a few minutes. Like, we need to do this immediately. And that's, that's what it is when you have a kid on the spectrum, you know, you have to be it's like constant, constant. It's constant. As a parent who, who has two children, what did you, what did you say? Mainstream? Mainstream. You- yeah. That's a real term. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and that's okay to say, this is, but this is basically my question as a parent with two mainstream kids, at least as far as you, as far as you know. Yeah. I never know like how far is too far to ask. Like, I don't want to be nosy. I don't want to, and I never know what, the wrong things to say are, you know what I'm saying? Like, but I don't think that's any different from people who want to understand more about the LGBTQIA community, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. If you're coming to me with questions from a place of interest and love, yeah, you go ahead and use the wrong word. And I'll tell you that's the wrong word. Yes, you will. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, I'm telling you it's the wrong word. But also, you know, language changes and evolves too, right? So what's the yeah. wrong word or the right word today might not be the same tomorrow. But I think if we're coming at it with the right intentions and, and a place of love and just interest, I personally would not get mad at somebody if they said, you know, I see your daughter does X and Y different than your son. What, what's that about? Oh, well, Jordan has autism. Oh, well, how do you know? Or, oh, I thought girls didn't have autism where people will say to me, oh, autism is new. Well, no, it's not. Like we just have <laughs> different ways of understanding it and, and defining it and, and that ebbs and flows and any and all questions, send them my way. I'm happy to answer them. All right. If anybody has any questions or if anybody has any questions for their own kiddos and, you know, like use Svache as a resource. I do. Please. It is kind of that th- same thing. It's intention matters and where yeah. are you coming from? And it's the same with LGBTQ stuff, right? And it's the representation that you always talk about. You know, like if I don't talk about Jordan, if I, if she's not out of the community, if people don't get to see, oh, this is what autism looks like, you know, this is what it's like to have a child on the spectrum. And then when they have a kid who's on the spectrum, or if they have a kid that comes out and they're, I don't know how to deal with this. I've never seen anybody deal with this. The only people that I know who dealt with this hid it away. So I should also hide it away. Yeah. You yeah. Know? There's a lot more fear. There's a lot yeah. more shame, which yeah. there shouldn't be. There shouldn't yeah. because it's so normal, right? Yeah. You need to start a podcast. You should start a podcast about this. Oh, have an idea. If only I had a friend with a podcast. And I I listen, listen. That I could muscle my way onto her show every once in a while. Let's talk about (laughs) the spectrum. I'm here for it. it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. And I don't understand why you have so many American flags. Quickly (laughs) explain to me the American flag situation. So we have two flags in our house. One that if you're watching on Spotify, which you should be. One very big one on the wall in my bedroom. And then there's a smaller one that's maybe like an eight by 10. When my husband and I first moved into this apartment, sorry, I'm straight. um, We (laughs) had a bunch of walls that we needed to cover. I don't know why. I was like, I like the American flag. I want one. I called up Chad. He was in Kansas City at the time. And I was like, I kind of want to get an American flag for our wall. And he's like, oh, me too. And so he came home with his tiny little flag. And he's like, look at what I got. And I oh. said, look at what I did. <laughs> it's like one whole wall in the bedroom. I don't know. I think as a woman period in this country, as a woman who is descended of people who were enslaved in this country, the American flag can be a difficult thing, mm-hmm. right? But my feeling is my dad's people came here as far as I know in 1619. They have spilled blood for this country. They have toiled in the earth. They have done as much as, if not more than any other person in this country. And this is my country's flag. And so I deserve to fly it as much as anybody else. And I'm not going to let people steal it from me and define what it means. Ooh. Ooh. Did you practice that? That was- I did not. (laughs) Okay, Stefatia. I I support you. I'm just saying like- And your love of the American flag. I do. I do. It's, I see it all the time because you, you post pictures um, on social media. Yeah. When I'm doing like yoga or handstands or whatever, it's my background. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad you've explained that to me. Thank you. I appreciate of that. Course. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, Jamie. Thanks for helping me introduce this little hair episode. We're going to have, you know, who roll the tape soon, but don't forget mm. you can follow on all the social media channels at the Queer Family Podcast, y'all. And you can listen on Spotify now and watch video episodes on Spotify as well as YouTube. But YouTube is full of trolls who like to say homophobic things to us. So oh, I no. Spotify now. <sighs> I know. I know. Follow the Queer Family tr- Podcast on all the platforms. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. Instagram. Treat yourself. Okay. Treat there, yourself. There it is. There Spotify. it is. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. Treat yourself. Yeah. And go do all the things, y'all. Love y'all. This is going to be a fantastic episode. To my straight ally friends out there, buy this book. It doesn't matter if it's not reflecting your family. It's not always a mirror. Sometimes it's a window or a door. So you should have this book in your house too. Even if you don't even have a (laughs) five-year-old. You don't need a five-year-old. Shoot. Educate your damn self. Uh, Yes, I love that. Okay. (laughs) We're going to have you on more to tell (laughs) great folks out there what to do. (laughs) Safatia, would you like to do the honors of telling you know who to roll the tape? I mean, the last time I did 
they were not so responsive. So I don't know. I think we need HR to come in here and write them up because like we asked them to roll the tape. I never hear from them. No, no response. No. no, yes. No, thank you. No, nothing. Pretty lazy. No, nothing. It, well, Nicole, Nicole will do it. Nicole's fabulous. I yeah. mean, how Nicole puts up with them, nobody knows. I really, really. I really Nicole, agree. Nicole, if you would please have <laughs> Helen and Bueller roll that tape, we appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Beautifully done. Oh Ooh, my God. Look at that. <laughs> how did that just happen? What just happened? Oh, <gasps> Jamie. Well, how come I'm not doing that? <laughs> I think, it, oh my gosh. Okay, now you really have to watch on Spotify so you can oh, see. Oh my God, there are hearts showing there up. There are hearts. Every time, I think it's because you're on a phone. I think it's because I'm on my phone. Oh my God. <laughs> Who knew? Oh my God, watch the video. Watch, watch the video. video. Queer Family Podcast, love is love. Hi, Roberto. Hi, Jamie, how are you? I am very well. It is lovely, lovely to have you here with me. The pleasure is mine. Oh, now stop. Now you're just buttering <laughs> me up. I, I really am very excited to talk to you because I love what you're doing and I think it's totally admirable and worth lifting up. So the listeners are definitely in for a treat, I think. And so am I because I have no, I don't know your story. I really don't know much. I like to be left in the dark as long, as long as possible. So without further ado, why don't we have you give us your 30-second elevator pitch of who you are and why you are here talking to the Queer Fam Squad. Are you ready? I'm ready when you are. All right, on your mark, get set, go. I am a proud, queer, Puerto Rican man. By day, I'm a diversity, equity, inclusion advocate and an in-house employment attorney. The proudest job title I have is of single parent. I am the parent of a beautiful and creative and just fearless young girl named Amina. And I wrote a children's book, More Than a Crown, named after her. And I look forward to talking to you about it. Boom. That was beautifully done. Under 30 seconds. Go ahead, Roberto. Thank you. Thank Go you. Go ahead. <laughs> I loved it. I love that. You got it all in. And we didn't practice you, that. You didn't. You didn't. I'm not even sure you, you knew you were going to have to do that. And that was brilliant. Well done like a true professional. And if you're watching the video, you will have seen that my dog opened the door behind me as Roberto was talking. <laughs> so it's like I have ghosts in the house. Okay, so let's dig in. You are a proud, queer, Puerto Rican man. Yes. Let's take it to young Roberto. Sure. And like, when did you know you were queer? And how did it go getting to the place where you are now? I always knew that I was different. I don't think that I fully understood what that meant until maybe seventh or eighth grade. I always knew that I enjoyed playing with the girls. I was never really athletically inclined. <laughs> and so for me, I always felt like I had to be twice as good as everyone else in school with everything else. So I always excelled <laughs> with my you know, academics, because I was like, that is the one place where I can, I can really show my chops and, and excel um, above the rest. And so, you know, for me, it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't until seventh or eighth grade that I started to understand that, you know, I wasn't looking at the girls in the same way that my friends were. When I was in high school is when I started to really explore. And I started coming out to different folks at, I think I was about 15. Um, so I, I had, I, wow. I came out at a, fairly young age, or I guess I would say at that time, a fairly young age. Um, and it's, it's been quite the journey. I mean, I think it, we're, we, we still go on those journeys. And now as a parent, that that's a different journey of a, of uh -huh. a gay person, right? Oh, 100%. You got to be out all the time and you're always coming out. Always. Absolutely. I've talked about it a lot more recently. Um, coming out is ongoing. It doesn't end. Even if you don't have children, coming out is, is a process that doesn't seem to end ever, honestly. And that's another thing, too. I, I think, um, you know, when someone has same-sex parents that are, you know, that's a couple, I think the coming out can look a lot different, right? Whereas opposed to a single parent, I think that that becomes less obvious. And so it just has to be part of the story. But I think for, for me, I, I've always wanted to be really intentional 
about my story and my daughter Amina's story, just because I think that it's something to be proud of and not something that should be shied away from. Agreed. hundred percent. I think everybody at home agrees with you too. <laughs> so Roberto is living that, living your life, 15, doing the thing. It came out, you, you know, go forward. And when does, when does family building come into play? I think, you know, for me, I don't know how much of it was due to just everyone in my family having kids. I think I just always assumed that I would be a dad. And I think as I got older, I don't know how much of it was just, this is something I wanted for myself. How much of this was me, you know, frankly, being selfish and saying, like, I want to be able to experience this, you know, unconditional love in in a way that maybe I, I hadn't earlier. But I would say when I was in my early 30s, I was with a, a partner at that time. And I just knew that he and I would start a family together. And so, you know, I wanted to go down the surrogacy route. He wanted to go down the ad- adoption route. And we just knew that we would make it work. I and mean, ultimately, mm-hmm. you know, at some point, you know, we, we went our separate ways. But at, after that relationship ended, I had an honest conversation with myself about what I wanted out of life and frankly, what was also within my control. So, yes, I can put myself out there. I can meet people. But there was no sort of guarantee when, you know, when it comes to a romantic partner. Mm-hmm. But I knew that I, I was ready, you know, mentally, emotionally to, to be a father. And so I decided... You know, while I always assumed that I would have a partner and then, you know, start that family, I decided to do it the reverse. And so I, I made that decision to have, a, to start a family on my own and then to, you know, have a partner sometime after that. That's amazing. I love that for you. Yeah. And to be so with it, like at 30, I was not ready. No <laughs> way. Yeah. I was like, let me take my time. That's super cool that you were just, you knew what you wanted and you were going to go after it. I don't know why I want to ask this question. It's not something I usually ask, but like, what was your relationship like with your, your parents and like, how did the queerness go? I mean, I do ask that a lot, but. So, I mean, my parents are still together. They've been married for 40 years now. Incredibly. Congrats. My mom, she was always the very sort of like warm and loving one, super affectionate. I don't think there was any shortage of hugs, kisses, and I love yous. My dad was just, he's much more sort of emotionally distant. He was always like Mm -hmm. the financial provider. Even thinking of like my coming out story to them. I mean, I came out to them like two or three years apart in time, even though they're married and together. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, for me, I always just assumed it would be much easier to have that conversation with my mom than my dad. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, although I'm much closer to my mom and I, feel more comfortable talking to her about these things. You know, I think my dad, frankly, that conversation went went smoother than than the one with my mom, you know, initially. I'm just going to interject because I I am so similar to you, like nurturing, huggy, all the things, mother, same with the dad. And then the conversation, wow, I thought was going to go one way. It was totally the opposite. I thought it was easier with my dad. I was like, quick. I was like, okay, boomer. It was so wild. I mean, the thing is, so we had that conversation and then we, with, with my dad, I had, we had the conversation, it went well. And then we just really don't talk about things. I mean, he's just, mm-hmm. not, he's not much of a talker. Mm-hmm. And so I find myself naturally talking to my mom about, about life. And frankly, I, I think even as an adult, like as an almost 40 year old man, like I still don't talk to my mom about certain things. And that's just more, that's more me. That's more habit. That's especially for someone that came out at such a young age. I think it's like a you know, self-protection mechanism that I still need to grow out of. I just find it so interesting that, you know, the person I expected to have a more difficult conversation with, it was frankly the easier of the two. It's amazing. It's amazing how these things work out, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it sounds like they're fully on board and it's great. And go ahead with your bad selves. Parents, good job. All right. So you're in your thirties. You're like, all right, it's, I'm going to do this. And you said you were interested in the surrogacy route, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so let's let's take take me through this. Yeah. So I had a friend who had gone through IVF herself, and so she had shared with me the name of a clinic. So I was just like, I really don't know much about what this journey entails. So let me start off by just going to a fertility clinic. And so mm-hmm. I couldn't use the one that she. I think she at that time she went to NYU. 
NYU mm-hmm. at that time was not, I think because, I don't know if New York still has this law, but at that time, paid surrogacy was still like illegal. And so, oh. yeah. And so they referred me to a clinic in Connecticut, Yale, and I ended up not literally falling in love, but just like really adoring my fertility specialist. I mean, she was the epitome of both sharing a wealth of information while also just being delivering that information in a way that's really sensitive. And I just remember being really overwhelmed because there were so many options um, and so many different routes to take. But like, I'm so glad that I went on that journey with her just because it just, it felt like it was meant to be. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously there's just like, you have to think about egg donors, you know, assuming you want to go the surrogacy route, you have to think about egg donors. Do you want to go fresh? Do you want frozen? And then thinking about after that sort of, you know, what you're looking for in the surrogate. And so again, mm-hmm. as I said, my mind was like blown. I was just like, this is yeah. a lot of information to digest. And ultimately they had shared with me a number of agencies that they had worked with. And I was just like, look, if, if they've had good relationships with them, let me start off with that because otherwise I'm going to go down a rabbit hole in, in terms of trying to find all these different agencies that, that are out there. Mm-hmm. And I had intended to, you know, use an egg donor, you know, through one of the agencies. Mm-hmm. And I think just in terms of the way that, you know, fate will, will do its thing. I actually have a good family friend. I call her family, but you know, she's a, she's a daughter's friend. She shared with me that she was, you know, willing to, be an egg donor for me. And at first I was just like, yeah, at first I was just like, uh, I just didn't pay her much mind. And I I was actually showing her, um, it was funny enough, I think there were two potential egg donors that I was looking at through agencies. And then she had brought Mm -hmm. it up again. And I said, well, let's actually have a conversation about this one so that I can understand like whether you're being serious about it. And two, to make sure that you understand what this process will look like. And she was on board. And so the only thing that I had told her was, we are close right now. I do not want this negatively impacting our relationship. Our relationship needs to stay the same or get closer. And she was committed to it. You know, even though I went into the process assuming that I'd be using um, like an anonymous donor, it's a known donor because a friend actually donated her ex to me. That's fantastic. How old was she at the time? Uh, She was in her early 20s. That's what they say you should, you know. It was, Young. it was prime, prime time. Yes. Yeah. I want to ask you this then, yeah. because we talk a lot on this show about, I call it the search for the superhuman and it's finding your donor and you get in, you get in a rabbit hole. You can, you can get crazy about the things you're looking for in the donor. And so I'm wondering, since you had already started the process with anonymous and then you pivoted to friend, did this friend have the attributes you were looking for in an anonymous donor? She absolutely did. And and then some, I oh, mean, I think, I think for me, one of the concern, I, I don't know if concern is the right, the right word, but one of the things I wanted to be mindful of was being able to share with Amina as much information as possible. And mm. I knew, and so that's why I, I wanted like at least a semi known donor, like, but I didn't want um, a fully anonymous open. donor. Yes. Mm-hmm. I wanted that option just so that Amina, you know, at some point she's going to ask questions like I said, I want to be as transparent with her as possible. And so I wanted her to have the benefit of being able to at least, you know, reach out when she comes of age, just so that she can ask any questions that she may want to have. Now, you know, any questions that she does have, you know, she can ask me and I'll have the answers to. And the egg donor and I also talked about, you know, one, once Amina starts asking those questions, like we can also have that conversation, you know, together to talk about, you know, how she right. came to be here. That's really cool. And that's really great that it all worked out. Okay. Digging deeper. Digging yeah, no, deeper. For, no, Did for. you have like physical attributes you were, you were looking for? I wouldn't say physical attributes. I mean, I purposely wanted someone who was also of a Latinx background. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, for I'm trying to think outside of that, I, I wouldn't say that I necessarily had any sort of like physical like attributes. I mean, I wanted someone... And then, of course, there's only so much that you'll be able to to tell from a person's, you know, sort of like application or the materials. But I wanted someone who was smart because I wanted, you know, for me, 
Amina is is a beautiful girl, but I also wanted her to know the importance of like education and, you know, working hard for whatever it is that you have. And so I wanted someone who excelled academically too. And then someone who like, even through like whatever essays that they answer just comes across as someone with personality, right? Because I think ultimately I want Amina to be a good human being. I want her to be a good person and Mm -hmm. it just, and to be kind, right? And so- I wanted to be able to get that from whatever it was that I read. And so I remember for the two that I boiled it down to before ultimately going with my friend, I did get that sense that like, yes, they were, they were beautiful women, but they also did well in school and just came across as good people. Right. And I don't think that we can ever minimize how important that is. Definitely not hundred percent. And that's what my wife and I always were said, like from the start too, you know, we want them, we just want them to be kind, good people in this world. Right. But then we got into the search and then I started getting crowd like, wait, he had acne. No, now <laughs> we can't have that. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. I started, well, I like this, this guy's eyes better. You know what I mean? Like I started oh, yeah. getting cra- ridiculous. So that's why I ask just because it's just a funny little thing that is very unique to our journeys towards parenthood. So, Actually, now that I think about the physical attributes, when I was looking, I think I also, and I don't know if this is a bit superficial, but I will share it anyway. I looked for someone someone that also looked like they could just be part of my family already. So that way they're just like, you know, aesthetically, like they look either like my mom's side, my dad's side, just like someone that would be, would have been part of the family. Yeah. I get that. Same. Like, yeah. Like a lot of times we try to find somebody that looks like the spouse who's not caring and blah, blah, blah. We do all, yeah, we get to get so creative, which is fun. And it's also can be way too much. So, (laughs) so she comes into your life. It's perfect. Did you still go through the agency for her process too? Like she got like onboarded? No, I, I think for her, what I did was, I mean, obviously I, we still made sure that we went the sort of the formal route. So we had a contract just so that she understood what her rights and obligations were and mine. Mm-hmm. I would ask, did you create the contract yourself or no. like, no, where'd I, you find the contract? I worked. So with uh, the agencies that, you know, I had been in touch with, they had like a group of attorneys. And so I just retained one of those attorneys to, to draw up the contract. I just thought that this was too important for me to DIY it. No. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. It's a lot. You got to make sure you're crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. Absolutely. But if you go the DIY route, you know, more power to you. And if it works out, that's great too. But yeah. So, okay. So got the contract written up, you start the process and you're not, you're not even thinking of certain, did you take this like piece by piece, one step at a time? Yeah. So I knew that I, I mean, I just know myself and I didn't want to feel overwhelmed. So I focused on the donation piece part first before thinking about the the surrogacy piece. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, we worked with the fertility clinic. I went with her to all the appointments. I mean, there was a point in time when she even like lived with me for that two week period or so I was injecting her myself. I mean, I really wish that we would have videoed it because yeah, I, I think one is just a beautiful journey, but two, it was also hilarious at the same time. I still remember giving her that first injection and I was just like, I'm not a nurse. What in the world am I doing? Like, and so I give it out to all those folks that self-administer. It is, you know, remarkable the things that that people are able to do. You get real used to it though. Oh, yeah. I, by the end, I was like, I was like a probably like tapping it. You know, I felt like a like I was create making drugs in my kitchen. Like. <laughs> well, the first time, oh, wow. I'm pretty sure that I was laughing and my hand was shaking, and I was just like, thank thank the Lord that this needle did not break inside of this woman. But yeah, <laughs> we still laugh about it. I love that you had that though. That's oh. unique. We don't all get that kind of you know moment, especially in a surrogacy process. Okay, cool. Then what happened? Thankfully, everything was really smooth. There were a whole bunch of eggs that were extracted. Good job, that girl. Yeah, she 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 definitely produced those eggs. So she didn't have kids at this point, right? No, she didn't have no, kids. No, of her. okay. No, she didn't have kids of her own. And we can talk about what I actually did with all the eggs in in a moment. But then I I ended up deciding to work with a small surrogacy agency 
that's actually based in New Jersey. I think it's two hours away in South Jersey, but it's based in New Jersey. I wanted to find a surrogate that was somewhat local. I wanted to be mm-hmm. able to, you know, go to all of you know her appointments. Um, and I wanted to just be present in case anything happened uh, without having to worry about catching a flight. Of course, like everyone has to make the decision that's right for, for them. But for me, I, it was important for me to be able to be pretty local. And so she was also based in South Jersey, like a two hour drive. I couldn't have imagined anyone else. I mean, she was just super, super type A. So she, I mean, uh-huh. she had, she was organized. She had her schedule, ate very sort of cleanly, much, much cleaner than I would eat. And so right. it just, it just worked out. I mean, I ended up, she has, she has two kids and a husband. And so of course, throughout this process, I, you know, I had met her husband, I met the two kids. And I think for me, I expected the kids, right? Cause I think for, for surrogates, they, they purposefully want, you know, women who have had children to help mm-hmm. mitigate risk. I was not prepared to speak with, meet with the partner, but I'm so glad that I did and that it was part of the process because I think I ended up loving him even more than 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 his wife. He was just so oh. while, while while she's like type A and very sort of like rigid, he was very much more like chill, relaxed, very welcoming. And so just I think the two of them combined just made this process so much more comfortable for me than than I could have imagined otherwise. I feel like surrogates and their spouses and their families are just you special people, right? Like, yeah, I could never be a surrogate. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Absolutely not. Like, you're, there's, I, I put them on a pedestal. I really yeah. do. I mean, and then they'll tell me, don't put me on a pedestal. Blah, blah, blah. But no, I do. You surrogates out there. You're good people. Absolutely. Okay. So egg donor, your egg donor, you're only, it was just one cycle and you got a bunch of eggs. Yeah. One cycle and we had a bunch of eggs. Yeah. Add a girl. And then... Before we get into the the journey with the surrogate, can we talk about the eggs? And you said you did something with the eggs, or maybe this is tied together with the pregnancy. So you do you, you do it? Yeah, I'm trying to remember how many eggs were extracted. I would say 25, 30 eggs, something along those lines. Wow. Yeah, that's a good catch. And, and I wasn't sure, you know, in terms of just like family planning, as I shared, like I always now that I had decided to go on this route, I was going to have my child first. And then at some point, you know, have the possibility of, of, of having and meeting a partner. And I wasn't sure what their own sort of like family planning looked like. And I was just like, well, let me save some eggs in case I meet a partner who also wants kids biological, you know, that biological route. And so Mm -hmm. I intentionally did not have all of the eggs fertilized. I had half of the oh. eggs fertilized and then froze oh, the other smart. yeah and then froze the other half of the eggs because I wasn't sure what you know what my future would look like and again whether I would meet a partner that that wanted you know himself to be able to go down the you know the circuit route. Right, a gene- like a genetic tie. Correct. With it. Wow, that's a, that's a cool idea. That's yeah. a first for me yeah. that I've heard. Yeah. In over 200 episodes. Okay. <laughs> cool. So you fertilized half and how many, do you remember how many you were left with? We definitely lost some in the thawing process. I would mm-hmm. say when it came time for the embryo transfer, I think we probably had like six to eight eggs to choose That's from. That's a good number. Yeah. And wow. ultimately, you know, and I'm sure, you know, I think everyone also has to sort of make the decision for them as to whether they want to select the gender or, or not. And for me, I literally had told the fertility specialist, I was like, whatever's the best egg there, that's the one you put in. Now, if there are two, one of each, then let me know. Cause I was like, I'd rather be making the decision than some medical professional. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have to make that decision. All right. So they just put the best one in and you were like, I don't care. I don't care that's exactly what right. the gender is. And what does gender mean anyway, yeah. really? I think the queer community knows that the best. Absolutely. So then you get your surrogate and then you're ready to go. So what, what happened? How'd it go? Like how many times? How many tries? I am incredibly blessed to have had a really smooth journey. I met. I first met with a fertility special, specialist just to talk about options and what this journey would look like in March of 2018. By the summer, we had eggs. 
by the fall, I had matched with my surrogate. We did the transfer in January. It was successful. And my daughter was born in October of 2019. Holy mo! That's quick. Yeah. That's like a true success. Like that's how quickly it can go in surrogacy, and then it could also take a lot longer. Yes. yes. Oh, okay, that's so awesome for you. And were you? T- did you tell people? Obviously, you told people because that's how you find your egg donor. But like, did your yeah. family know you were going through it? And even talking about the surrogacy journey, I think there were maybe like a handful of friends that knew I was even thinking about it. My mm-hmm. mom knew that I was doing it. And that was it. Again, just in terms of not wanting to feel overwhelmed, I knew that the, this journey was going to be an emotional one for me, both highs, lows, and everything in between. And so I did not want to have to worry about other people's feelings or emotions <laughs> or frankly questions at that time until I was ready. And so mm-hmm. I told myself that until we had a successful like embryo transfer, I was not even going to talk about it. And so most people actually didn't know about it until the 20 week mark. I think I had shared it with some family members after the first trimester, but it was on the hush for quite some time. That's so straight of you. Like that's such a hetero, <laughs> heteronormative way to do it. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. like we, we didn't tell people we were trying yeah. and then we wanted to wait. Yeah. Yeah. We don't get that that often. I will say the 20 week hetero mark thing, that was definitely intentional. I was just like, there's so much of this that I'm in control of. I was just like, let me do something quote unquote traditional and just Uh wait. And that's what I'm going to do for the first part though, in terms of not sharing with folks, it was really just because I wasn't sure where I was going to be emotionally. I wasn't sure what the journey was going to look like. And Thankfully for me, it was relatively smooth and easy one, but it certainly didn't have to turn out that way. And, and, you know, I wanted to prepare myself for what could have been, you know, a much more time consuming or emotionally like difficult journey. Yeah, I totally get that. And I think that's a great, that was a great plan and it worked out. So that's perfect, you know? Okay. So take me through it. You're, you're about to be a single dad, Yeah. right? What were your thoughts about that? Like I, were you scared? What were you, what were you thinking? I mean, I think there was a little bit of everything. I mean, I was scared because the idea of being responsible for another human being, (laughs) it is quite the responsibility. And then you'd also just think about, you know, your own childhood and the things that you really enjoyed about it that you want to impart on, on your child. And then you also think about ways in which things could have been done differently, including by people that you love. And, you know, you want to be able to to learn from others' mistakes while also leveraging the things that they did well. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, for me, for example, as I mentioned before, you know, my mom was always the warm, welcoming one. My dad was the one who was really the financial provider. And so I wanted to make sure that, yes, I was a financial provider to my child, but also that that I was also the emotional support system that I felt like I didn't have for my own, like, biological father. And Mm -hmm. so, Amina, now, like, there is no shortage of of hugs and kisses, and I love yous, and I'm proud of you, and playtime, and bath time, just because, like, to me, those things are all important. And I want her to understand that these are things that a parent is responsible for. And so it's not just one, it's not the other, it should be everything, right? And that's not just, I'm Mm -hmm. far from perfect, but I want to be the best version of me and the best version of a parent that that I can be. I love it. I think you sound pretty perfect to me. I'm just saying. (laughs) Trust me, (laughs) that is not the case. (laughs) No, I know. Listen, it takes a village and it is so hard. It sounds like you're doing, you're doing great. Let's, she's what, three now? She just turned four in October. Yeah. Happy birthday. So let's talk about this because let's, let's pivot like to your book a little bit. And I think we should start kind of with what were your ideas on talking to her about her origin story mm-hmm. and and we touched on it a little bit but can we just like go deeper into that and then maybe that'll segue into the book a bit so for i mean in terms of the origin story as i shared like i i want to make sure that when it comes time for that conversation that i am honest i'm transparent and in a way that is like understandable at that age you know we haven't mm-hmm. had that origin story conversation yet frankly i'm, I'm surprised that something hasn't come up just yet, given that, I mean, she's been in school for, you know, quite a bit now. She's a bit, you know, she was in daycare starting at 18 months. 
which is in the Montessori school for the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. But I also think that she is just also mature for a a four-year-old in in some ways. So again, like that conversation hasn't been had yet. And as much as I tell myself I'm mentally prepared for that conversation, I don't think that there's going to be any amount of of preparation for that for that particular time so i just hope that uh you know that i'll start from a place of love and that you know the words will just come out in a way that just feels really organic and and natural listen i'll tell you what we got books we had there's so many books you can get that just kind of explain it and then i just put it in the rotation at night with the nightly reading and it's a nice easy way then they start asking the questions when they're ready to ask but whatever however i was just having a thought while you were talking so you're her dad and but she doesn't see you partnered up with anyone. So she doesn't necessarily realize that, like, it's not two dads. You're just, and and kids at school, other kids at school know about just dads, right? Like a lot of kids just have a a single dad, you know? A lot of kids, um, parents are not together. And so uh, people would probably most likely make the assumption that you're just a single dad, but that there's no different kind of like, origin story to even talk about. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. With my family, it's we're two moms, so it's clear. And the kids see it and our kids see it. And so it's more quickly, I guess, asked about yeah. than perhaps like with your situation. I mean, I actually was partnered for, for almost two years during. Oh. I wasn't sure if she was even going to have questions about it, but she didn't. You know, I think she just understood that, you know, this was my partner and that we loved each other and we cared about each other and that we were affectionate, including in front of her. And that even that didn't sort of trigger any questions. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, that's why I say in in some ways, I feel like she's very mature for her, for her age, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's inevitable. It'll, it'll, it will come up. (laughs) That's why it's so great to have those books because, you know, they have books that are for all ages and then you can get whatever, family makeup you want. You can get gay single dad. You can get gay single mom. You can get two moms. You can get like, they run the gamut of all the different identities and things. And it's just an easy way to just start like dropping the seeds of that idea into their head so that when they're ready to pick it up, they have kind of an idea. And you can always just pull the book out and say, remember, you know, this part, well, that's, you have a donor too. You know, that's a really easy way. A lot of people do that that I've spoken with, they just get a book and just get it in the rotation of the nightly readings. And yeah. then <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Idea then you don't, have to worry. you don't have to worry about the language as much, you know, it's kind of done for you and break it down to the science too. You know, we don't have to make it all gross, gross. Funny story. My daughter, so my daughter, um, is 10 and we have gotten into watching young Sheldon as like, oh, a, yes. like a yes. family. It's good for her age and it's fun. We enjoy it. Anyway, the mom like gets pregnant at one point accidentally. And it's like an episode about what are they going to do? She's pregnant. And <laughs> my daughter, she could, when, she, when she had the pregnancy test and said, it's positive. My daughter went, oh, she's, she's pregnant? And I'm like, yes, yeah, I guess she's pregnant. She, how? How is, how is she pregnant? And I'm like, um, her h- husband, the dad? what? How? And then I'm like, oh, this is the kids of queer people. Cause she's, you know, she's like, well, where'd the donor come from? Who's the donor? Not thinking that, oh no, no, she has the sperm in her house that she can just use that. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's free. They they didn't have to buy sperm. (laughs) And then she was like, okay, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Cause she got grossed out because it was like sex, you know, (laughs) (laughs) she's very well versed in how babies are made. And also just, so that's, anyway, it's just, yeah, get, get the conversation going. And I love that and, story uh, though. It's ridiculous. <laughs> right? I'm never going to forget that story. It's so <laughs> It just happened the other night. So let's, let's get to your book. How, where'd the book come from and why'd you write it and what is it? You know, at, at some point I, you know, understood that I was going to be having a girl and I just thought about what would it mean for me as a girl dad to really create this environment in which she feels not just loved, but also valued and empowered. And especially for a a young girl of color, even more so. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I had come across was, you know, like nighttime affirmations, right? And um, I've come across this like beautiful book 
called I'm Smart, I'm Blessed, I Can Do Anything. And I was inspired Mm -hmm. by that to come up with my own series of like nighttime affirmations, which I would say to her every night in English and in Spanish. And then now that she's, Mm. you know, older and can speak, like she'll repeat them after me. And so she'll say every night that she's strong, she's smart, she's beautiful, she's important, she's brave, and she's going to change the world. And so oh, I noticed yeah. that I didn't start off with beautiful, right? Because as I mentioned before, yes, uh-huh. in my, like Amina is a beautiful young girl, but she is much more than that. And I think it's so important for kids in general, but girls in particular to understand that like their value is not tied to their external beauty or how others perceive of like of, of their beauty. It's so important. I just want to say, I love that for her to hear that coming from her dad is like even more precious and important, you know, like a lot of times, yes, our dads feel like that we can do anything as females in the world. However, there is still that stereotypical way of raising girls that kind of puts us in these boxes, even when our dads think we are more than just looks. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So it is so important to hear that from dad. I think. And talking about sort of getting out of the stereotypes, I mean, I think that was sort of the impetus for writing this book. I mean, of course, and I'm sure, you know, you and your wife had the same experience where I'm just like, okay, well, now I need to think about like these great books to read to, you know, to read to my child. And I just found like there are a lot of children's books that are just not great, right? They may be really popular, but they're not that great. And Mm -hmm. so I sort of wanted like a modern fairy tale. So Mm -hmm. the story centers around four princesses, all of whom are of different sort of cultural backgrounds. Again, I thought it was really important for Amina to see herself on the pages of a book, for other girls of color to see themselves on pages of a book as princesses, Mm -hmm. just because they receive, you know, different um, messages from media as to like what a media, what a princess looks like. Yes. And also make sure that it's one that focuses on the girls less on finding a prince and more mm. on them challenging traditional expectations of girls, finding their voice and, and following their dreams. And in this, in the book, I purposefully have the young girls, you know, talking about careers in industries that are currently male dominated, because I think it's so mm. important to be able to, to see these things um, just so that you, you know, they have to see it to believe it. Yeah. And I think, you know, fairy tales, yes. there, there's research that, that talks about, fairy tales and how sort of girls and children sort of receive that information. And so I wanted it to be important for them to see themselves in it and being able to kill it in these industries where they're frankly just not an, not enough women in them. Mm, I love this. You did some research. Wait, had you ever written a book yet? No, no. Like children's books? Like that's a whole nother. Like... Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> This was a labor of love for Amina, and then it just turned into, you know, a bigger project. That's amazing. And so did so you had an illustrator? I haven't seen the book yet. Now I have to see the book. Oh, I have to, yeah. I have to, I have to is, oh my God, I need to get the book. Look how cute. And this, is, and this is Amina, and these are her uh-huh. three princess friends. So I, you know, worked with this, like, young, just really incredible illustrator. And I'll show you one. The way that, that she brought these, like, characters to life is just, like, incredible. Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love those pictures. Thank you. Yeah, everybody has to check it out. And you will. I know they will. Do you show up in the book at all? Are, are you a character? Absolutely. Come on, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> so, another thing. <laughs> so, you know, in, in terms of just thinking about, you know, what your podcast is supposed to create, right? It's supposed to be a, a, a world in which we really foster community and, and celebrate our stories. And so... Yes, while the focus of the book was really going to be about um, empowering our kids, I also wanted it to be a story that recognized different family structures and also celebrated them. And so, exactly. yes, there are two family households, both same sex and, and, and opposite sex, and there are single parent households. And so I wanted to, so yes, I definitely make it in the book as a single parent to Amina. And then we have a mixed race couple, We have a traditional, you know, opposite sex couple, and then we have a same sex couple. I love it. Yeah. Good job. That's what's lacking in so many, not just books, like all the stories, right? Representation on all fronts. 
I remember um, as part of this, I was looking at like what stats look look like. And I think a few years ago, I don't know if there's more recent research, but I think less than 2% of children's books are written by someone that's Latinx and that has like Latinx representation. And similarly, the less than 2% of children's books have LGBTQIA plus representation and that are on those subjects. And so my hope is that this book is like one small step in, you know, really making sure that the stories that we're reading are by us and for us. I love that. I appreciate it so much. You self-published this. Who knows how different would have it would have been if you didn't self-publish, sure. you know, like how, if you would have had it to fight, you know, the powers that be, so to speak, but there needs to be a lot more of this. So Absolutely. maybe we all just need to self-publish and just please, get it out there. Please. <laughs> you know, I mean, across the board, I'm talking TV shows, I'm talking movies, I'm talking everything, right? It's not enough. It's not enough. And I'm not going to stop till it's enough. And I don't think you're going to stop either. So I appreciate that. We have work ahead of us, but it'll, it'll be you a good do. One. Yeah. And it takes a community and that's what you're doing. And I really appreciate it. And that's why when you reached out, I was like, hell yes, this is yes. It, <laughs> this is exactly like the point. So <laughs> I'm really happy you wrote this beautiful book and I can't wait to add it to my kid's library. I love it. And tell everybody and me where we can find this book and all the things we can do to help you out because yeah. we need to support queer creators. We need to support Latinx creators, right? Let's yes, t- tell us how we can uplift you. Yeah. So uh, the book is available on Amazon. The book is called More Than a Crown. As of right now, it's on Amazon Prime. So you should be able to order it and get it fairly quickly. And of course, follow me on Instagram at More Than a Crown Book. And you can see everything about the journey. You can see some adorable photos of, of Amina and just some things that I've done, you know, to really sort of amplify the message. I think, you know, I, I know that I had shared this with you separately, Jamie, but it doesn't matter how good a children's book is if no one knows about it. And so, mm-hmm. you know, especially as as someone that doesn't have, you know, name or brand recognition, you know, or, or ha- doesn't have celebrity status, I think. And for someone who's self-publishing, you know, in, in terms of who knows about the book, it's really on me to amplify the message. And so... If you can purchase the book, great. And if you can't, if you can follow and share with other people, the more people that know about the book, the the better. And again, it's really just putting it out there that there are these books that are representative of us that really share a message that, you know, frankly, I would have wanted to hear and and read as a a young kid. And so the more that know about the book, the better. I love that. And I'm going to add some stuff that they can do for you to this. You can write a review on Amazon. You can, of course, comment on anything on the social media pages. This all goes for me too, y'all. This all goes for me too. (laughs) Plus one. (laughs) You can, yeah, you can ask your kids' school libraries to get the book. Yes. Tell the school librarians or tell the principals or wherever, whatever. It's a good addition. And also, you can ask public libraries. You can recommend that they get books too. So, you know, everybody, wherever you are in the world, go to your public library and request the book there and they will order the book and then it will be in circulation there as well. Do that and do that for mine too, guys. Yes, seriously. Those are, those are great additions. <laughs> this has really been like such a pleasure. I'm so happy to know you. The pleasure is mine, Jamie, seriously. I'm so glad that you said oh. yes. Oh, me too. Me too. And, and you're right across the pond. So maybe we'll, we'll see each other at Pride or something. I'm all for it. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Did we forget anything before we say goodbye to the listeners? As a parent, one of the most important things that we can do is encourage our children. You know, when thinking about the messages that they need to hear, you know, sometimes both in terms of, you know, what they may listen to, what they may hear in school, there are all these competing messages, right? And so it's on us to really create the environment in which, you know, we want them to be uplifted. And so we need to encourage mm-hmm. our kids, right? We don't, we, we can't expect them to be perfect, but we can expect them to be brave. We can expect them to be kind. And I think once we encourage our kids to be the best versions of themselves, like it just creates this beautiful growth mindset and allows them to be authentically themselves, right? Which is what any of us should, should hope for them to be. 
Yes, agreed. 100%. I am down with everything you're saying. And I adore you. I'm so glad we've met. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your book and also your story with our audience. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Anytime. Anytime. Queer Family Podcast. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, feel free to listen to another or watch another. I have so many episodes for your listening or viewing pleasure. Just go pick one and and enjoy. There's a lot. There really is. And also, if you really do like this show, please, I know I say it all the time, but please do consider supporting the show on Patreon. You're just going to go to patreon.com slash the queer family podcast. You're going to pick a tier. You're going to join and you're going to get that bonus content. And you're also going to get my love and adoration for the rest of my life. (laughs) I love you all. Thanks for tuning in. Keep on tuning in and I'll see you next time. Mwah.